Okay. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Film Roundtable. Um, hopefully a lot of you, as usual, are, are kind of picking this up on whatever podcast of choice that you have. Um, there's also on the YouTube channel, um, if anybody wants to go back and see that. I'm very lucky today to, uh, as most people out there know, I always like to speak with friends and colleagues that I have in the industry. And I have today two very new and will become long running friends of mine in Hiro Mirai and Christian Springer. Um, welcome gentlemen, how are you today? Good, Good. Thank thanks you. for having us. Good seeing you, Doug. <laughs> Good seeing you too. And um, I, for full disclosure for everyone out there, Christian and Hiro and I are kind of in the throes of an Amazon show. I'm not giving away any secrets. Anyone who has IMDB can find this, but we, have been uh, launching um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, the IP based on the original movie. Um, and that's kind of how I came across uh, meeting these two who have known each other for a very long time and worked together on, on, uh, on Atlanta, on Station Eleven, on Guava Island, on a bunch of music videos as well. Um, and I'm actually curious, Hero, as we kind of just lay a basic foundation, why don't you tell us what was the first project that you and Christian worked on together? The, technically, the very, very first project we worked on was pickups for a Nokia phone commercial. Uh, <laughs> that was all uh, miniature work. Uh, and it was like half a day. I think, I don't even know if we like exchanged more than a handful of words. Uh, and it was just like a handful of pickups. And I, but I was known about Christian just because, you know, we're, we're in the same circle and, you know, I, there was like a, a music video scene in, in, in L.A. Uh, that was growing and I knew Christian through a lot of friends. Uh, but the first time we officially, officially worked, uh, you know, uh, was the Atlanta pilot, which was seven years ago at this point. And, and how far after the, these Nokia pickups, as you say, did you guys work on the Atlanta pilot? I feel like it was probably a solid, probably five years or so, right? At yeah, least. It was a long time. Yeah, yeah. It was a long time. And so, all right. And Christian, why don't you tell us from what do you remember in terms of from the, you know, the the pilot itself? What 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 can you tell us? Some of your memories of that first time you and you and Hero working on that narrative together. Um, you know, like you were saying, we sort of like. <clears throat> we sort of uh, all kind of came up in the same sort of world of, you know, familiar crew and producers and lots of friends. And, you know, I feel like the sort of like East LA uh, low budget music video uh, circle was like pretty small and tight. So we all kind of like knew each other. And we, you know, we definitely like uh, seen each other, you know, at parties and stuff over the years for screenings and, so it wasn't like we were just starting off cold. You know, we, we definitely like, uh, I felt, I think we both felt like pretty familiar and pretty comfortable right off the bat. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it's, I think Hero and I both uh, have a very similar philosophy and approach uh, work very similarly. And it, it just kind of like felt very na a natural way of starting where, you know, we sort of, in some ways, I think on that pilot, we kind of like both came to like a uh, uh, nonverbal agreement that, you know, we was we were sorting sort of like building our, our um, prep technique, if you will. Um, and I feel like to some degree, we sort of used that and honed that technique uh, ever since. And, and that's interesting because that brings me to exactly the next thing I was curious about, which is your guys' collective approach to story. Now, the one thing I've always said um, is no matter what, story is paramount, right? The audience will forgive lots of things, but it's the story that's really important. And, you know, having been in the throes with you guys a little bit, like, Hero, why don't you tell me a little bit how you and Christian together approach story in prep to decide how you're going to visually approach something. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's always funny talking about process because I don't know how anybody else does it. 
you know you can <laughs> you only know what you know you know uh but i think i think what's unique for us is you know i forget when we started doing this but whenever we break down a script uh you know we we it's usually scheduled a shot list thing but what we actually do really is just kind of break down the kind of emotional sort of moves of a scene you know so we talk about what's interesting to us personally about each scene like oh this moment is really interesting from this person's perspective or like you know story wise it's doing this but i i think like the undercurrent or the subtext is that you know and and it's not even about like trying to analyze the the scene in to uh to an antiseptic kind of way it's just it's just sort of about like guttural reaction to a scene you know so it's it's about our perspectives uh and then usually we build the our, our shot list and kind of how we want to cover it and how we want to play it out from that perspective you know so it's we 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 it starts from a really loose place you know and I, and i don't know how if we've always done it that way but you know more we've done this and more comfortable we get with each other and more we understand uh each other's perspectives on you know how we want to uh shoot something I, i think the conversation becomes more abstract and uh a little a little looser i think you know it used to be more about like oh this will you know we'll do close up one close up on this guy two you know two shot on the other side da 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 but lately we you know we, we don't really even do shot lists anymore it's just sort of about like this is about this so we should kind of feel this moment from this person's perspective or it should be more sort of passive and 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 you know voyeuristic or you know it's it's more about kind of feeling than abstract ideas more than um, any, anything to to regimented or like strict i think yeah i think you know i was thinking about this last night because we we were also coloring a season of a show that we just finished at the moment while we're working on the show and so we've been doing like remote color work and so <clears throat> we saw like a pass of color and i was sending a bunch of notes in last night and i was thinking about how much over the years our process has become so much more subjective and more discussion on emotions and feelings and the audience's experience and how it's moved away from like shots and coverage on set we certainly discuss a lot about like how will this edit or like building a sequence you know we try to build that stuff uh in the moment once we've seen what the actors are doing but i think from a prep perspective we have a lot more of our prep time is devoted towards uh sort of emotional journeys of characters character development plot you know what uh, an audience's experience of the plot of the story um so it becomes a lot more of a subjective discussion i also think you know like a like a good conceptual idea generates other good ideas you know so like i think when talking about in a broader sort of like you know uh emotional terms it's 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 useful for actors it's useful for crew it's useful for kind of generating more ideas to build off of that core concept you know and, and so i think when you get too uh detailed up front it it's sort of restrictive in some ways because you want to give people room to sort of like live in that that moment and kind of generate their own sort of take on uh what the scene is you know yeah and also you kind of like encourage other people's expertise into the conversation right when if you're like this is going to be done like this then no one really mm-hmm. has an opportunity to like interpret that into like their skill set uh and you know i think you know i would say doug i think we very much had that experience with you as an ad where like you know we have these kind of large bigger scope production discussions or or just narrative discussions and that tends to lend itself to just you know opening up of the creative process to like the rest of the collaborators that are making the per- making the film with you you know yeah i've noticed that about you guys especially is that your the ability to you know whether it, you know take any type of genre concept but just boil down what the emotional connection is to the characters involved that's how an audience relates to something and and you, and you guys are very good at talking about that and letting people understand that that the journey is the character's emotional journey you know part and parcel from whatever the big scope idea is of whatever the show is based on you know and that's such a powerful way of approaching something because it allows the audience to connect 
with the characters. And if you connect with the characters, you connect with the story, right? So, you know, right. I, I find that to be a, 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 an amazing way of approaching it. And, you know, you guys are, you guys are really good in your partnership at the way that you approach that. Um, and it really has been, a, you know, a, a true pleasure to be able to work with you guys and see that. Um, here, I want, there was, I want you to clarify something for me because you said something to me one day on set, which I found incredibly fascinating. And you and I were looking at a monitor and, and we were talking about the image contained within the monitor. And you actually said to me, what really fascinates you is what's happening outside the frame that people can't see. Can you like hmm. elaborate upon that? Because I found that to be so incredibly powerful in terms of how you judge what an image is. Hmm. I, I think that's true for I think that's true for everything. It's, it's true for the edit. It's true for timing. It's true for what story you see versus what story is happening outside of what you see on film. I, I think so much of, I don't know, it's so much of filmmaking for me is about sort of implying that a real world exists outside of what you see, right? Um, it's, as long as if you see one angle of a house, like, behind me right now, it's implied that the rest of the house exists where you can't see it. And I think in some ways, you know, cinema as a, as a medium, it's, a, it's more powerful to let people sort of engage and fill in the blanks than, than show, show it to them, you know? And it's, uh, there's this, um, this Miyazaki quote where he talks about this thing called Ma, uh, Hayao Miyazaki, the animator, uh, which means space uh, in, in Japanese. And he's talking about it in like animation terms where, you know, what's important to him is the moments between action, right? So it's like, if somebody's jumping, it's the, it's the moment of him kind of bracing the jump and then him being at the peak of the jump and then the landing, not so much the action itself. And so I, I think that's true for, for film where I, I think that, you know, a lot of like the, the sort of the transcendent things about the format come from, from not, not the subject, but kind of like the spaces in between and, and things that are not necessarily the, the primary focus of, of what you're showing, you know? Um, and that, you know, you think about like Westerns and things, you know, they, it, it uses that, the limitations of what you can see inside of a frame so well, you know, it's, whether it's with sound or, you know, you, you choose to reveal that there's a guy holding a gun uh, on the other side of, of a close-up uh, and that tension and, and, and what you have to fill in with your own mind is kind of the beauty of, of the medium, you know? Um, it's, uh, I don't know, I, mean, I, I don't have like a super articulate way to like describe it, but I, I just think um, you're really giving people something so they can fill in the blanks, you know? And I think that audience engagement is such a big part of watching the film. That's, that's fascinating. And that, that is a great response. And that is, and I found it really, you know, when you said that, I was like, wow, there, there really is, because we all think about it. We all think about what is not happening. What is not happening and what are happening are two, are, are two things. You choose to show the audience one particular thing, but there is constantly an action that's not happening that forces the audience to kind of fill in the gaps or think about as well, you know? And I do think that, that that's a fascinating way of approaching it. And it lends itself into the style of you know not needing fourteen setups to tell the story of uh, you know one page of people talking you know it's you know then then you you're you're giving away things that the audience should be forced to think about if you're showing them every single conceivable angle within a cut right it's like someone who talks way too much you know like <laughs> you're gonna be more interested in a story who is deliberate with their words and takes their time than someone who's trying to you know talk you to death. I think. No. And if you talk to much, you'll likely say something stupid. So it's better. Yeah, to... there you go. You might as well hide <laughs> your stupidity and let people assume that you're <laughs> quiet because you're smart. That's why we don't overcover things. <laughs> <laughs> smart. Well, no, I... go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, I think going back to what Hero was talking about and, and, you know, what we were discussing in terms of, of prep and, and, you know, approaching story and all this stuff, I think, you know, really as it ties into what you're talking about with coverage, 
know, I think what it's allowed, what, what those discussions have allowed us to do is to really, you know, approach something philosophically and have uh, some sort of direction in our minds as we're approaching something literally, how to cover a scene or how to put a scene together where, you know, essentially we sort of have this philosophy or this decision that we've made about that scene already in our minds, which then, you know, so, so often ends up being what we rely on to kind of answer those questions of like, how do, you know, do we need this piece of coverage or does everyone need to get a close up? You know, basically there's an intentionality that you can run through this philosophy that you've discussed through, you know, what the scene is or what's, uh, you know, what the, what we've decided is important or interesting about the scene. And then it sort of informs the structure of how we approach the coverage so that we're not just walking into a, a day's work and, you know, getting a wide shot and a medium shot and two singles on every scene, on, you know, on the call sheet. Yeah. And there is, there is a classical language to that. Cause right. If, I mean, we're all students of, you know, what we consider to be classics. Right. And, you know, the, there is a simplicity in the way that movies were somewhat shot because it was about story and it was about acting. Right. It wasn't about, you know, fancy coverage or crane shots or other things that, you know, lately has become more of the norm, um, yeah. you, know, you know, for people to feel like they need those tools or that way to tell a story. So, you know, it is classical that way, you know, um, and, you know, in, in that mindset, we're talking about classical and talk about inspiration. Hero, for you, what what filmmakers, what made you say, you know what, I want to do that? What were you watching? What was there a pivotal, you know, movie or director or something that made you say, that's what I want to get into? You know, I think, I think when I was a kid, you know, I already brought up uh, Miyazaki, but like his, you know, animated films from the eighties and nineties were really, really impactful to me. Um, it, there's just something about him that felt there's something so sort of deliberate and 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 you know the the craft is obviously incredible because you know it's animation he, every single detail feels like there's intention behind it but there's also something about it that felt very found you know and observational which is such a difficult balance you know to do something that feels sort of intentional and you know obviously it's it's every frame of it is is intentionally created but it also feels very restrained and well observed and and kind of kind uh and i think that's always stuck with me um and then i, I think when we first started making atlanta uh, a big inspo point for us was uh coen brothers you know i i think there's something about their perspective as filmmakers where you know it's so much about <laughs> these these sort of outsider characters who are confronted with the absurdities of the world and you know every interaction uh, every you know dialogue scene almost feels like a like a confrontation and a, and a battle you know uh but it has this underlayer of this like existential sort of malaise and and confusion you know and i think that 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 really lent itself to what uh, Donald's character was going through in the first season of Atlanta. So we we kind of, you know, we did a lot of kind of our versions of it where, you know, every dialogue scene was where we were inside the, uh, the conversation on a wider lens. You know, we, uh, we played a lot of things on very simple coverage and that, that, kind of layers do the work for us if there's an event that's happening over somebody else rather than a cutaway and um rhythmically i think you know the scripts were written in such a kind of a like a naturalistic but also very sort of like like bouncy rhythmic way that it sort of lent itself for like kind of re repetition of coverage so you know it goes from uh earn to whoever uh he's confronting back to him back that 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 that, that and then you cut to something wide as a punctuation uh i don't know if you even talked about it on those terms but i i think i think we pulled a lot of references and talked about the language of that show wanted to be very early on that that's great and and then christian for you too in terms of 
your visual approach. I mean, I, you know, I have to say, you know, you are, you know, you are in this new age of digital cinematographers, your technical ability and your color science on set and the way that you want to capture image on set, but in a very old school stylistic way, you go to emulate you know, the way and the look the movies had in the 70s and thereabouts when Gordon Willis and, you know, Storaro and some of these other cinematographers are trying to create the richness on film. You are pushing the envelope always digitally in a techie way to do that. So in the same inspirational way, what, you know, what do you look back upon to create that palette in your mind? Yeah, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think, uh, early on in my, you know, my creative journey, I think, you know, I'm sure like all of us, like Stanley Kubrick and, um, you know, all the classic films that we've all kind of grown up on and, and been inspired by, I think those are all the, you know, Scorsese's films, those are all the films that, you know, the nostalgic, uh, the nostalgia of, filmmaking on film on celluloid comes from um i think <clears throat> you know i was very fortunate to kind of get out of film school and enter into like professional career right when the industry was kind of making that big transition away from film into digital and so i kind of came up through film school on film and then when we got out of film school uh all of a sudden everything started to become digital and so I feel like in some ways I was lucky to kind of get the education uh, of, of what, you know, lighting and exposing uh, and, and really using film as a medium um, that I then just kind of like applied very early on before I got stuck in any mindsets, I could apply it to digital. Um, you know, I think uh, here and I often talk about, you know, I think when we were in film school, like our generation in film school, it was also this kind of like really incredible time in short form where like, you know, you had uh, Spike Jones and Chris Cunningham and Michelle Gondry, like these kind of like uh, pivotal sort of short form directors that were, you know, exploring and, and experimenting quite a bit. And I wouldn't necessarily say that it has made me like a contrarian, but I would say that I think that came as inspiration to me in a very like pivotal moment in like my uh you know development as a filmmaker and i think in a lot of ways a sort of like almost granted permission to break the rules or do things differently or just maybe just go out and explore uh you know or an experiment in, in a medium that you know a lot of other people aren't really doing it almost felt like that was like the coolest punk rock thing that those filmmakers were doing. And I think to me, I sort of like left film school with a lot of that punk rock energy of like, I don't want to go make movies and TV shows that look like every other movie and TV show out there. I think I like felt pretty charged up to like go try to explore and find something new. And so I think that the fact that like all of a sudden there was all of this like crazy digital technology that was like, being released very quickly uh, on in the industry i was like gobbling that stuff up and i wanted to like learn how to break it and make it you know make it look different than everyone else's was looking so i you know in some ways i think film to me represented this kind of like infinite possibility of you can do you can make it look like anything through processing and you know through types of lighting exposure and whatnot and then digital felt very like clinical and felt like this is the way you expose digital you use these you know exposure meters and this is exactly how you put your highlights and I think uh Atlanta was like a really fun experiment in a lot of ways where we were just like I don't know let's make it look crazy <laughs> and it was <laughs> it's so much it. fun it's so much fun to like work in those you know, under that context you know what I mean that the, and here, as you just say, let's break it. That's exactly Atlanta for a lot of people. I mean, you know, the success of Atlanta, which uh, one of these things, right? When something becomes successful, you can't look back and be like, oh, yeah, we thought that was going to happen. That's exactly how we planned it. Right. And obviously it's taking time as it got successful and 
the people involved got successful. It's obviously taking a long time to go from one season to the next, to the next. Um, but for you guys and the progression of that show, Hero, for you particularly, first, if you could answer, the progression of that show, you know, what for you were the creative challenges from taking one season to the next as the anticipation of the audience grew? I mean, you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I've said this before, but I can't tell you uh, how little I understood television when we first started making Atlanta, you know, I, the Atlanta pilot was the first narrative, anything I had shot. I mean, you know, we've made short films before, uh, but you know, I'd never made a film and never made a TV show before the pilot. And, and, you know, I think a lot of our first, our, our early collaborations, uh, collaborative moments of me and Christian were me pretending like I understood what Christian was talking about when he was talking about coverage. You know, because like he's done way more TV than me at that point. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I, you know, like, you know, I, I, thought, I thought I understood tone. I, I understood vis the kind of the, the basic stuff of visual storytelling. Uh, you know, I, I knew that Donald and I were trying to make something with a very specific tone and perspective. Uh, I think I knew how to get to that, but just like the basic sort of structure of how to construct a uh, a, a scene in a narrative um, narrative film was very new to me, you know. Um, but there was also this kind of excitement uh, because when Donald first approached us and, and talked about this thing, he kind of gave us free reign. He just said, like, I want this show to get canceled. Like, I, you know, I, I don't think this show is supposed to be on TV, but they kind of let us have it. So we should just do everything we want to do and kind of play and see what happens because we're probably not going to make it to season two. Uh, and we know, and, and FX, uh, to, to their credit, like they sort of let us, left us in a bubble and, and, and figure out how to make a TV show. You know, it took us like four seasons to realize all the things we were doing wrong, you know, in season one. <laughs> uh, but that was also the beauty of it. Like, I think, you know, when I look back on, the early seasons of it I, I see us playing I see I see us experimenting I experiment experimenting in terms of like coverage color science how much grain we can put it error on linear television um you know tone can you know one of the editors said to me the other day like uh he met like an older editor like a more kind of like classic tv editor and uh very early on when he when he got pulled in to do Atlanta and he'd never done TV before this either. The editor said like, I'll give you one tip. Don't ever leave an empty frame. Don't let people exit and just sit on an empty frame because it completely kills the rhythm. Uh, and he was like, that's the only thing we do on this show is just create <laughs> weird pockets and like just empty spaces until people walk in. And so, you know, it's like, it's a blessing how little we knew back then and how much we got to kind of try things and, 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 and learn on the job, you know? And so in some ways, yes, we are, you know, we think about what each season of the show means to people and how people receive it and how do we, you know, progress and, and do better and all those things. But like really every year, I think the challenge for us is going how do we retain that sort of feeling of exploration and, and experimentation? And, you know, how do we, how do we enjoy it? You know, how do we enjoy the process of making it? Uh, Cause it's, you know, it's obviously hard every time it's a television show, um, but it has to kind of mean something for us for it to be good, I think. Uh, and yeah. so we kind of approach it from that perspective, I think. Yeah, I don't think any of us expected it to be uh, a hit. I certainly didn't think that the pilot would get picked up. I mean, I, I had a lot of fun making the pilot and I thought we made something really cool, but I remember coming back to LA after I made the pilot and I was like, there's no studio in the world that is going to give us money to keep making that show. <laughs> and yet yeah, to, to FX's credit, like they really, they really like took a chance on us, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it, I, I would certainly say I remember going into season two where all of a sudden season one had come out and was like 
popular and getting really good reviews. And I remember feeling a little nervous to like start up season two and like, how are we going to make it better? How are we going to top the last season? And I don't know. I think that that stuff was all kind of like pre pre pro jitters. And then once we got into it, it's also a show that's like made on a shoestring budget with a shoestring schedule. And there's no time to like, you literally have no time to like worry about, is it going to (laughs) work? You're Mm -hmm. constantly just trying to like make your days and, and stay, you know, stay within the budget. And so I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever like felt too much pressure or anything like that. Uh, And I also think that there, there seems to be like a really you know, strong audience and fans that really seem to love any like crazy, weird, experimental thing we try. Uh, everyone seems to be like pretty receptive to it. So it's cool. But also like kind of a blessing about the show is like every season has sort of reflected where we were in our, you know, respective careers and also in, in the reception of the show. So like season two really became uh, sort of like an anxious horror season about <laughs> about the cost of success and what does it mean to you know have a have a, a relationship to your audience that's like one-sided you know uh and like we whatever anxieties we were feeling we just kind of poured it into the show you know so i i think i think that's kind of what i mean by like uh like just making sure the show feels sort of like emotionally connected to us because i think that's the only way the show works really yeah, that's a great way of saying it. It almost becomes an extension of where you are in the moment, right? So as you progress, the show progressed, you know, it's almost like a mirror, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that, 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 that's fascinating. I mean, that is a great way to always think about creativity, right? Because creativity um, ebbs and flows and grows as, as we do all as artists, you know, and it's always like, you know, chasing the tail of that dragon without getting whipped off, right? That's 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 part of the fun and part of the scary thing that keeps us all going every day i suppose it keeps me going that's for sure yeah mm. you know and so as far as when you guys just you know i mean station 11 is such a divergent change in terms of just what it's about big picture but what it's about small picture is people and the relationships to each other which you clearly mastered in in Atlanta. So is, is that kind of how you looked at station 11 as you went in there? It's like, let's take the microcosm of the human emotion, regardless of the genre piece we're involved in. Yeah, that was the kind of the, the big thing when we first started talking about it. Cause you know, I, I, I told Pat Somerville, who's uh, the showrunner uh, writer, <laughs> when he first approached me with the project, I was, I was like, I'm not super into that genre, you know, like it's, I, 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 I love watching it, but it, there's something, you know, it, it tends to fall into nihilism uh, porn a little bit. And it's, it becomes so much about kind of black and white survival and, and just desperation for survival and all those things. Um, but then I read the pilot and I think the incredible thing that Pat does is he injects this sort of like absurd humanity into whatever he's writing, no, no matter what the, what the genre is. And so I kind of realized like, oh, this, this story is about a bunch of petty, unprepared people who have to face this sort of big genre prompt. Um, and, you know, especially the pilot, you know, when Chris and I started breaking it down, we we're just like, oh, this is about like a, like a stunted adolescent, uh, 30 something, i.e. us, uh, who <laughs> is forced to take care of a child, even though he is not capable of it while the world burns around, you know? And so we we're like, oh, we know how to do that. You know, we like, we can, we can tell that sort of, uh, micro human story. And there's something kind of interesting about about how small that story felt uh, set against this sort of massive global incident, you know? And so the contrast of like the macro and micro felt really fresh and interesting to us, you know? So we get to do kind of our character-driven sort of micro human story, but the, the, the undercurrent is this sort of like massive, you know, spectacle um, uh, genre movie, you know? 
Yeah, which is, I mean, I've said this before, I think on even on this podcast, but I've, I've shared this story and it is, and it's the same thing in line what you're talking about, but I'll never forget a lesson I learned from Steve McQueen when we were making 12 Years a Slave. And I actually said to him, I said, you know, how do you come at this thing? You're making a, this, I mean, a story about American slavery. It's such a huge concept. And he said, Doug, you miss what we're trying to do here. We're telling a story about a man who's trying to get home to his family. Everybody can mm. relate to that. And it's like, and from that, I always took that lesson of the idea of from a storytelling perspective. It's not about this big, whatever the big, everything's always going to have a big story that surrounds it. But if as filmmakers, as storytellers, we can attack the grain of it that has a universal understanding or a universal denominator, the audience will latch on, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I think it's also, it, as a filmmaker, uh, it gives you like a like something to grasp onto and to hold on to as a guide on how to tell a giant story like that right like who i i i don't know who you know like i feel like aside from like roland emmerich like who what filmmaker can go out and like tell this massive global story and for and and keep your audience engaged on an emotional level you know and i think when you when you can tell yourself like, oh, actually let's just focus on this, like this very simple, like small human narrative. It's much more, you know, you can, you're, you can break it down a lot easier. Your brain can kind of swallow that, that concept a lot more. It's a good point. You give yourself a little guidepost and that makes it just easier to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and then, so, I mean, and obviously, you know, uh, as I said before in the beginning, you know, we've all been working together on a project that's hopefully going to come out next year, which extends your guys' creative relationship with Donald, who's obviously another very key figure in, um, you know, your guys, you know, work wheel. Just tell us a little bit about, you know, Donald and, you know, working with him as a collaborator. Again, you know, it, it's, it's a funny thing because I, I don't know what, what a normal working relationship is, uh, you know, because we only know what we know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> with Donald, I mean, I don't know. He's a very unique guy. You know, he's, he's clearly just, he's a brilliant dude. He's very talented in very many uh, facets of, of, of what he does. And and I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's what I've always really appreciated about us collaborating with Donald is that it's never felt uh, like we had specific roles you know we were, we were you know he it, when we work on something together it, it does kind of come from a, this sort of this egoless place where we are really excited about an idea or a story or like a feeling and we just kind of get to build it out together and we just use whatever tools that you know and strengths that we have as individuals to kind of achieve that goal you know and donald is you know very good at sort of conceptualizing what's the core of what's interesting or what's um what's what makes something watchable or or interesting um you know and he uses that as a writer but also as a performer and i i see a lot of what we do me and christian is is sort of play the other side of it where we go okay then what's the framing device uh both you know uh, both literally and and also just sort of conceptually that makes that idea feel special you know um and i what i and we never really talk about it too explicitly, you know, I, I think, I think like all good collaborations, it's, it's sort of like unsaid, uh, like alchemy, you know, and I think Christian and I have that too, where we don't explicitly talk about why, what we're doing or why, what each of us do complement the, the thing we do uh, perfectly, but it just does, you know, and so you, it becomes a sort of goal oriented thing where you go, okay, this is kind of the, the feeling that we're trying to achieve. And we all kind of just, do play our play our instrument and and see how it all sounds together is that is that a, is that a nonsense answer does that make any sense what i just said no i mean I, what, go ahead i would just say to add on to that i think i think what makes donald particularly unique too is that because he is such a multi-talented performer and and creative in general and he he just has so many creative outlets that you know, people tend to worship. Uh, I think he also like has this incredible perspective on culture 
that I think is really interesting. I feel like so often we end up getting in conversations about culture, American culture, or the audience, or a global culture, or music culture, or whatever it is, but he just has this like perspective and this kind of philosophical understanding of human culture uh, that I, I can't say I, I've ever met another person who like constantly muses on that subject so much. And I think that that influences his work so much and, and thus obviously ends up influencing our work so much. Um, but it's so interesting to see him, you know, I, I obviously shoot for him as a, as a, when he's a director as well. And I feel like he, much like we were saying earlier, he's so razor sharp at just like honing in on exactly like the point of something and mm -hmm. doesn't waste time like getting things that don't matter or that we're not going to use or whatever it is. But he has such a incredible ability of just like honing in on the most important thing. And <clears throat> I, I often think that like a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, he came up as a writer, his background in comedy, he understands performance, uh, and he also understands an audience experience, I think, uh, you know, on this like completely other level than most filmmakers, because he, you know, that's what he does as a, as a live performer. And uh, it's really interesting to like see him apply that to filmmaking, you know, he, it really, it makes him like a very efficient filmmaker. And I think it, you know, he is able to like make very smart decisions based off of that background. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. I mean, in lots of ways, you know, you got, you know, you guys together are a jazz ensemble, just always looking to create that perfect piece of music, you know, and who, you know, who leads, who fills, who does what becomes a tangential fluidness that just feeds the creativity and feeds the the story that you're trying to project, you know, and that's, and that's, you know, and that's, and that's fascinating. And that's what I, I really love about you guys. And that's, you know, what we all, I always try and tell, you know, young, you know, whenever we get approached by like young people, like, oh my God, you've done this, that, and the other, what kind of advice do you have? I always say, surround yourself with like-minded people, grow mm. as a group, you know, when yeah, you grow yeah. as a group, you're only going to get stronger, you know, and, and I, I think that that's so important. And clearly that's something that, you know, you guys have rooted together and done, you know, which, you know, which is, which I love and I find fascinating because I think, you know, that that's the one thing we can share with the next generation, just be around the people, you know, that have the same goals, ambitions and ideas that you do and, 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 and grow together. Yeah, yeah, and I think also spot on. it very much so applies to, you know, crew and, you know, your collaborators and post-production. I mean, we, you know, we've used our same colorist for, seven years you know caitlin as our post-production uh producer who's been with us since the beginning you know my gaffer and most of my camera team and you know all those people are sort of like have become a family and everyone you know you obviously like you're saying everyone's sort of like uh picking up slack and passing over responsibilities so that you're building this like very efficient machine but at the same time everyone is also kind of encouraged and empowered to be an artist in you know in their own right and and contribute to greater good and it's it's a it's a really it's a very rewarding uh collaborative environment well i've seen how you guys do it and i i really hope that you know now i'm part of this collaborative environment and i get to roll with you guys you know for the next 10 years before they kick me out of this business <laughs> Doug, I don't know how we ever did it without you, to be totally honest. <laughs> no, um, it's been a, been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I'd be remiss. I really want to thank you guys for your time. and uh, But I'd be remiss. I'm not sure when this is going to air. But for the Emmys, Hero, you are nominated for Station Eleven and Atlanta coming up. And Christian, you are nominated as well uh, for your DP credits on, on Atlanta. So I wish you guys. And Station Eleven. And, Christian, you're nominated on both as well. I didn't realize that. So you're both yeah. nominated on both. Okay. Well, listen, that's uh, <laughs> that's something. That's something. Wow. Well, listen, I wish you both the best of luck because the Emmys are coming up, um, you know, in the next couple of weeks. Not sure when this uh, podcast will hit, hopefully somewhere right before then. Um, but it's it's been a pleasure having you guys on the show. And it's been a pleasure working with you guys for the past six, seven months of this year. Thank you, Doug. It's been our Back pleasure as well. Doug. All right. Well, Absolutely. Listen,
Thank you, everyone. And uh, that's it for now. I'm going to stop this recording. Thank you, team.